Molly, welcome to the Way Champions podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to a good conversation. I, I am too. You're just back from vacation. And you're all refreshed and ready to go. And so, uh, well, we'll dive right in. Um, what inspired you? Like, uh, you, you've, you've had this interesting journey uh, as an athlete, as a as a coach, youth level, club level, collegiate level. And and now you're out there, you know, you have this great background in communication and and, and leadership. Um, what what got you to today? Yeah, I as you alluded to, it was a journey of kind of moving up the coaching ladder. Was both a college professor teaching communication courses and eventually a college soccer coach, mostly in division two. Mm-hmm. I realized at some point the reason I was coaching was I just love developing people. And mm-hmm. soccer was just like a reason for us to gather. Mm-hmm. And so I started to sense this kind of feeling of could there be a wider audience? And could I share what we're teaching in athletics? because I believe it's all a transferable life skill. Could I share it in other industries? Are there other possibilities out there for me? And I also know that the system of college athletics is very much a broken system. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you have to leave the leave the role that you're in and come in in mm-hmm. a different role. Mm-hmm. And so six years ago, I walked into my athletic director's office. I said, I quit. And she said, oh my gosh, who hired you? And I said, no one. Mm-hmm. I don't have a job. <laughs> I'm going mm-hmm. to start my own business. And uh, it's it's been a really, really great journey. I now get to work with teams and organizations all over the country on things like leadership development and conflict resolution and team building, all the stuff that if you do it well, you can take a good season to a great season. Mm-hmm. And if you do it poorly, your good season suddenly becomes the sinking ship. And mm-hmm. I love the opportunity to just walk alongside leaders and coaches, help them be better and help them have a more positive experience. Mm. Does do you look back on your own career first as an athlete and then as a coach and look at these mo like how many moments influence what you do today? Going, man, that team should have been good, except dot dot dot, or man, that team probably overachieved because of dot dot dot. Both, I have yeah. both of those experiences. I often describe the work that I do. Um, as helping coaches deal with speed bumps, what are the mm-hmm. things that slow you down? And mm-hmm. can we remove those speed bumps mm-hmm. so you can go as far and as fast as you want? And I had some teams that removed those speed bumps. We just figured it out and we went farther and faster than we should have. From a mm-hmm. talent perspective, wow, how did we accomplish that? And then there were other teams where we had the talent, but we couldn't navigate our speed bumps. And so mm-hmm. I can certainly look back now and think, I wish I had had somebody with me. I wish I had had an ally like myself who could mm-hmm. say like, did you notice that speed bump? Let's let's work that out so this team can get some momentum and get moving. Yeah, and and sometimes it's really helpful to have that outside perspective who can un- you know sort of not emotionally detached but less attached than the day-to-day coaching staff and and look at it and go like you said, have you noticed Mm-hmm. what's going on here? How how can you, you know, why haven't you addressed that? Right. right? And well, it's amazing. It, yeah. It's interesting because every time I work with a team, a coach will kind of roll their eyes and say, I said the same thing. Why did they write it down when <laughs> you said it? I, I've been saying that for months. Why aren't they yeah. listening? But that same truth applies with coaches. If you're always just around your coaching staff, mm-hmm. sometimes you just need an outside voice who who might say the same thing, but it sounds Mm -hmm. different. It feels different, or it might be a unique perspective that you haven't Mm -hmm. heard. So if it works for our student athletes, it probably works for coaches too, to just have a different voice and a different perspective that again, is not so uh, emotionally tied to the history or the outcome or the challenges that that team is facing. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, Jerry and I work on the collegiate level uh, a lot. And I I just, I, I remember years ago, Uh, having a conversation with a woman named Jenny Levy, who's the women's lacrosse coach at North Carolina and has won three national titles and I think 10 straight final fours. And she's just an amazing human being. And she just said, she, I remember her saying, you don't understand how much coaches need what, what you guys offer because, because, um, in many, and she's like, you know, at Carolina, I'm very lucky. My my office is next door to Anson Dorrance. I could walk into Roy Williams' office, a basketball coach. I could go anywhere, right? And there's these legendary coaches, and everyone's doors open. She goes, most of the people I know, they can't do that. 
their their athletic department is siloed. They they can't go talk to the football coach or the basketball coach or whatever. And so everyone exists in their own world. And and you know, you you certainly, you know, if you're working at North Carolina, you can't call the coach at Duke for help. They're not gonna help you. So you're stuck, right? And so having someone like yourself to sort of shine a light on the program and and look at it outside perspective and and say, okay, well, you know, let's go. War, war, warts and all. What's right. good about this and, and what needs work? It, right. It's absolutely critical. And I think for the own uh, emotional, mental health of coaches, like they need this, don't they? 100%. I, I can't tell you how many coaches, particularly like um, those that I'm on a retainer with, the phone will ring at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I see that coach and I think, Oh boy, this is probably going to start with tears. And, and sure enough, that coach just needs to talk something through. They just need to know that they've got somebody in their corner who at the end of the conversation, all I might say is coach, you're doing a great job. Tomorrow's a new day. You mm-hmm. got this. And it's like, okay, you're, somebody sees that I'm doing a good job. Somebody recognizes that I can manage this. Mm-hmm. Uh, coaches need that, that support. It's, it's a lot of weight on their shoulders. And, and certainly as the investment financially grows, that pressure grows with it. And so mm-hmm. we've got to have allies and advocates that can walk with coaches on their journey. Yeah. And then, I mean, <clears throat> coaches care, like they all, no one gets into coaching going, God, I hope we don't win this season. Right. right? But sometimes you're up against it. What, what do you, what are the most common things that the coaches that you have worked with or currently work with? Like, what are the big issues that they that they face? I, I think the biggest issue, uh, which it's so simple and, and yet it is the biggest issue, and you've already alluded to it, is this feeling that I'm alone mm-hmm. and I'm the only one that's facing this problem. I'm the only <laughs> one that's having this issue. It's yeah. me. I must have created this. And I have a a program that I've run for the last two years. It's called the, it's called the mastermind for college coaches. Mm -hmm. And it's Mm -hmm. 11 coaches that meet every two weeks. And at the end of the six months, everyone's in tears. And I'm saying, well, what was your biggest takeaway? And they're all just saying, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. My goodness. If that's the biggest challenge that coaches are facing, that they feel alone, that they feel like they did something wrong, that they feel like they created a mess Mm -hmm. that's fixable. That's yeah. fixable, but coaches need to know they are not alone on this journey. And so when we can help create those communities and those connections, it makes such a big difference for them. Yeah, that's such a great point. And, and I mean, this is life, right? This is, you know, every teenager thinks they're the only one going through this journey. Right. Most of those college coaches, athletes think that they're the only one feeling this way, feeling fear, stress, anxiety, whatever. And so many coaches do it. And it's just, you know, so like, a, you're not alone, and B, this is normal, and right. C, welcome to life. Right. <laughs> right. Like, right. And, but how it's so helpful for people to hear that from an outside voice. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, it absolutely matters. Awesome. What about inside those locker rooms for today's college coach? What are some of the consistent things you hear? And then maybe I'll chirp in with a few of mine. Yeah, I I think one of the biggest challenges is helping a freshman transition from what I would call a recruit recruiter relationship to a player coach relationship. Mm. And it's not something that we name very well. It's not something that we talk about very well. And I, I certainly am doing that with the teams that I work with, but with the transfer portal now, with some of the the ways that we have made it easy for players to exit, that the exit strategy is right there. Um, we have to help them understand that when they get there, their freshman year, the coach hasn't changed and they haven't changed, but the nature of their relationship has changed. And so mm. the recruiting process is all about sales. Yeah. It's about talking about potential. It's about what could be, but the day you arrive as a student athlete, our relationship just changed. Now it's about me helping you maximize that potential. It's about mm. helping bring that to reality. And so the number of times that I'll sit down with a freshman who's been on campus for like a month and they say, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I'm a transfer at the (laughs) semester. Uh, I just, I got tricked in the recruiting process. The coaches aren't who I thought they were. I'm like, time out, time Mm -hmm. out. What, what are we really talking about here? Well, you know, they were so excited about me in the recruiting process and now they just, they're on my case. I'm like, do you mean that they're coaching you? (laughs) They're helping you get better. And the moment I can help a young person understand 
they didn't change the dynamics of the relationship change. Now they have to help you maximize that potential and bring that to life. Mm -hmm. It's like the freshman just relaxes and says, oh, they don't hate me. Huh? They're coaching me. Okay. I can do that. Do, I can they, do coaches need to do a better job of fore forecasting, foreshadowing that, Hey, th this is what's going to happen, right? Like yes. we want yes. you to come here, realize when you hear, like I, I talked to a, a very famous wrestling coach, but, famous wrestler. Um, and, and he wrestled for a legendary coach named Dan Gable at university of Iowa. And he said, he said, you know, the one thing Dan Gable told me in the recruiting process was if you make it become an all American, become a national champion, become an Olympian, it's not because of me, it's because of you, it's mm -hmm. all you. Right. And he said, he gave me ownership of it from the, from day one. And I feel like that was like, he said, that was a really important thing. Cause I couldn't blame the coach. It was, it was on me. And he's like, I will help you. I'll be there. I'll teach you. I'll coach you, but you're going to make it or you're not going to make it. Not me. And, and I thought that was cool. And what you're saying, I, I like, that is such an important point. And I know we have a lot of listeners who are college coaches, but even a high school coach of like, mm -hmm. you know, you know, any any coach, when you have a, a a new athlete come into your team, to your program, right, and you're coaching them, helping them understand that coaching you doesn't mean I hate you. Coaching means that I love you. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. 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 So so what do you say to coaches if you are having this conversation over and over and over that your athletes don't understand the shift in relationship? Well, it's been interesting when I've had that conversation with coaches, it's immediately the light bulb goes on in the room for them. Yeah. Like, oh, that was a natural progression for me as a coach. Of course, I recruit them and then I coach them. But I can see for an 18 year old how no one clued them in to that process. And it's right. a simple conversation to have with a student athlete once they understand, because my sense is they they withdraw and they try to figure out. Well, what did I do wrong? Why doesn't this coach like me? Where where did I get tricked in this process? How mm -hmm. do I fix this? And when we can just help them understand, I'm just coaching you. And this is yeah. exactly what you signed up for. And it's what I signed up for. Yeah, Everybody can relax in that process. But honestly, every coach I've shared that kind of insight with, they've all just kind of leaned back in their chairs like, oh, how did I miss that? I, I never explained that to our incoming players. Yeah, it's really insightful and I think super important. Um, another thing you talk about, um, th th this influence, right, of like, and you talk about the difference between positional power and relationship influence. So this is my role as a coach, but this is also my role as a team captain or senior or whatever as well. So talk about that because I think this all kind of goes together. Yeah, I I – Often we'll share with teams this idea that leadership is influence, mm -hmm. but a lot of them are thinking that leadership is power and, and they're seeking that power. And the challenge with having power on a team is it has to be given to you. Someone mm -hmm. has to say, you're the captain, here's the armband, or uh, you have the authority, you have the title, you have the rank. The dangerous part is it has to be given to you, but it can also be taken away from you. Mm -hmm. Influence cannot be taken away from you. Mm. Um, we all have relational influence. And sometimes I'll say that to a coach and I, I can kind of see the gears turning in their head and they're like, I don't know if they all have influence. And of course, the example that I that I will share with them is, okay, just imagine that your worst player comes out to training and she is in a bad mood that day. She failed a test. Somebody broke up with her over text. Uh, her parents left an angry voicemail. She's in a bad mood. Does her bad mood affect the rest of the team? And of course the coach is like, well, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. but time out. You said she was the worst player. Like, mm -hmm. are you, sh are you sure? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it would affect the team because we all have relational influence. Mm -hmm. And so helping student athletes to rethink leadership from, well, somebody has to give me the green light. Somebody mm -hmm. has to give me the title, the rank, the authority to you already have influence. How do you want to leverage mm -hmm. that influence? Mm -hmm. um, you don't need a captain's armband. And, and the truth is a lot of us get it wrong when it comes to captains. Um, we're not with our team 24 seven. We don't know what's going on those other 22 hours a day. We don't always get it right, but you don't need that armband. You don't need to be a senior. You don't need to be a starter to be able to lead. And in fact, I was 
working with a team the other night and we were talking about leadership. And I said, guys, I got to be honest with you. I've never had a coach call me and say, Molly, we need help. We have too many leaders. Mm -hmm. Can you come get rid of some of our leaders? It's never happened. Mm -hmm. um, so there's space, lots of space for people to lead in different ways, to lead from different places. For a sport like soccer, you probably have more players on your bench than you do in the game. And so you need leaders on the bench as well. And I've, to had, me, that's... I've had a lot of coaches tell me we we have too many people who think they're leaders right. and, and really what they are, they're influencers and they're influencers in a wrong, in the wrong way, 100%. or, or they insist on having a voice when their voice is not needed. Yes. Right. So how do you navigate that? Yeah. I think we have to understand what is the outcome you want to create mm -hmm. as a student athlete? And did you just create that outcome? So that moment where the game was on the line and you got in that freshman's face and grabbed their jersey and screamed at them, did that Did that help? Did mm -hmm. they go score the winning goal? Mm -hmm. <laughs> probably not. They were probably mm -hmm. in tears and had to be pulled out of the game. And so helping young people to step back and say, well, what's the outcome that you want and how can you create that outcome? And the truth is for most young people, leadership has not been modeled for them. They're just repeating the behaviors that they've seen from previous upperclassmen or maybe from a coach. Um, certainly, you can't flip on the television right now and say, that's a great leader, and that's a great leader, and that's a great leader. And so we've got to be really intentional about helping them understand you can create a specific outcome, but you've got to be intentional about that path that you pursue to create that. Mm. Well, I, I I love I love this, and I love this. I don't know if you're a listener to our podcast, but probably for the last... 250 or so uh, sign off with your influence is never neutral, right? It, you always leave either a positive or a negative influence. And we talk about that with the college teams that I work with and, and Jerry does as well of like, you have an influence. And I think your point, soccer, lacrosse, field hockey, thinking of sports that I work with, there are more people not playing than playing. Right. Right. And so you all have an influence. And if you are on that bus to that away game, is that a positive right. or negative right. when you know you're not going to play? Right. Right. And and I and I think and again, when at the collegiate level, you have a collection of people who have always played. So right. so many of them are in a, in a completely unfamiliar scenario right. in their life and they don't know how to deal with it. And oftentimes coaches just will figure it out. Like, no, teach, like teach, teach. Yes. yes. How do you, how do you teach? What do you advise them to teach? Yeah. I think they have to have a framework for teaching leadership mm -hmm. and it has to start with their freshmen. Yeah. Uh, I hear so many coaches who say, oh, well, we'll just, we'll take care of that their senior year. I'm like, it's too late. Too you late. wouldn't, you wouldn't teach them soccer skills their senior year. You're going to yeah. develop them from day one, their freshman yeah. year. And I think we have to be really, really intentional about how we talk about their role on the team and we talk about their worth and value on the team. Mm -hmm. You know, when I when I think about why does someone choose to play college athletics, we have to be honest, so much of their identity is tied to playing time. It's tied mm -hmm. to their value, to their worth, to their purpose. And so when that playing time isn't there, I think it's very natural for an 18 year old to think. I don't have, what am I doing here? There's mm -hmm. no reason for me to be here. Actually, there are, there's lots of reasons. Let's mm -hmm. really dive deep in the ways you're making a difference, the way your voice matters, the way your energy matters, the way your mm -hmm. effort matters in training and help them see that, that, that they are making a difference mm -hmm. um, and that there's a path in front of them to get to where they want to be. Because mm -hmm. So many young people look at a senior. Let's let's take women's basketball, for example. A freshman comes into women's basketball. Well, those seniors, let's say it's a graduate, a graduate player. They've probably played 120 to 140 games at the college level, and you've mm -hmm. played zero. Yeah. <laughs> and all you see is, I just want to be where she is. Right. Well, you might have to go play 120 games to yeah. get there, right? Yeah. And every every game, every training, every lifting is just one step closer. It's just a rep. To getting, it's just a rep. It's yeah. just a rep. Yeah. 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 You got, you got to do your reps, you know? And I, I mean, I say to, you know, same conversation with that freshman who's frustrated because they're not playing. And I'm like, well, who are you behind? And it's like, well, you know, she's an all American and whatever. I'm like, wow. So every single day you get to practice against the best player in the country, in your position, right. who has a, a better opportunity to improve on a daily basis than you. 
You mm-hmm. have the biggest opportunity of any player in the country because no one gets to compete against that kid as much as you do. Right. And and you're looking at it as a negative. Yeah. Like this is the greatest gift you've ever been given right. if you choose to use it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah. We've got to name those things and help them understand the situations that they're in. Yeah. hundred, hundred percent. Um, so, you know, I just, I just wrote this down. Well, if leadership is influence and, and you're saying that we all have influence, like, does that mean everyone's a leader? When yeah. do you have to be a leader? When do you have to be a follower? Right. I, I think one, well, two things I'll say. I think there's a small percentage of people who are born to lead at the highest level. In the same way, there are some people that are born to be artists or musicians. You you flip through social media and you see a four-year-old that can play the piano and you're like, well, I think they they were born to be a great piano player. So there's a small percentage of people that were just, it's in their DNA. For most of us, we have to develop as leaders. We, we have to invest in our skills. We have to make our choice. We have to leverage our influence. But to me, one of the greatest skills of a leader is choosing to follow. It's choosing to say, I could lead in this moment, but the gift that I'm going to give that leader is I'm going to follow them. I'm going to make this simple for them. I'm going to have their back. It's what I would call being the first follower because first followers get things in motion. Have you seen that video, the Derek Seavers video, the first follower? I don't think I have. Oh, you're missing one of the best tools of your arsenal. I'm going to email it to you after. It it, it became a TED Talk. But okay. it's one of the most awesome videos of the importance of the first follower. Okay. It's so okay. cool. All yeah. right. I'll put the link in the show notes. Everyone there we go. Well. There we go. I it, love it. I love it. It's yeah, awesome. I, I, I think the best leaders I know are able to read the room and say, okay, that person has taken the lead. I'm yeah. going to go have their back. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to fight them. I'm not going to try to outlead them. I'm going to choose. It, it is to me, it's not your A leader or your A follower. It the two things go hand in hand. And there are moments when I need to assess the room and lead. And there are moments when I need to assess the room and recognize we have a great leader. Now, how can I have their back and make it simple for them? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um you talk about four stages of leadership development. And and again, I wanna just make it clear. You have this program called Coach Ready, and and so I'm pulling a lot of these questions from this this online course that people can get as well. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, what what are these stages of leadership development? If I'm a coach and I want to develop myself, my staff, and my athletes, yeah, I, I think this is really critical because again, a young person needs to know there's a path, and I'm on that path because they're just looking at where that senior is that they respect and they're thinking, I don't know how to be there. Mm -hmm. So the four stages that I love to share with teams in terms of leadership development is first, you have to be able to lead yourself Mm -hmm. at a bare minimum. No one can lead your life other than you. And, And when you look at really elite athletes, high performing teams, they're made up of people who are able to lead their own life. These mm-hmm. people get to class on time. These people get to training on time. These people have their gear with them. At a Even if you say, I don't ever want to be a big time leader, you have to lead your life. So mm-hmm. it starts there. Second stage that I share with them is you. once you feel like, okay, I can lead my life, what's next? Lead your peers. So on a mm-hmm. college team, that's a freshman who can lead the other freshman. That's a freshman on a Thursday night when the freshmen are going out for the first time can say, time out. Mm -hmm. We have a game tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're making the best choices. So lead your peers Mm -hmm. because there's a sense of equality there. When you can do that successfully, then you move on to, can you lead your positional group? Mm -hmm. So if you're a center back, maybe you're a freshman or a sophomore and you can lead yourself really well and you can lead your peers. Now, can you lead the back four? Mm -hmm. That to me is really a microcosm of leadership. These are people who might be of different ages. These are people who have different skill levels. These are people who have different roles on the team. So can you lead your positional group? And then lastly, now you're ready to lead the team. Mm -hmm. And so often what I hear from young people is I'm ready to lead this team right now. And I'm like, great, but you weren't able to make it to training on time today. So let's go back and let's go through this progression. And my experience has been once they see that progression, they understand, oh, that's why 
That's why I have to be in training on time because that's in that's in stage one of leading myself first um, and work that work their way <laughs> up. Well, well, it's really interesting. I think I'm thinking of this as from the head coach having the conversation with that senior who is upset that they're not the team captain, right? right? And right. and say, you know, and and in my experience, um, like a, a lot of times. You know, when I look at stage two, lead your peers, I, you know, I might switch the word lead with influence. You certainly influence your peers. I'm not sure yeah. that you lead them, yeah. but oftentimes it it starts with number one. You, you're right. how many, you know, weight room sessions did you miss? Right. Uh, how many times have you stayed after and, and helped a freshman improve or teach them something? Well, I, you know, I'm really busy. Awesome. Fantastic. You're a student athlete. You're supposed to be busy and have an internship and this and that, but you're not the team captain right. because someone's doing that and you're not. Right. So I, I really like that, that, that framework yeah. um, is, is really good. Why do, why do we get captains wrong so often? What do you see coaches doing when they select captains? I mean, like you said, they're not there 24 seven, so they don't sometimes see the influence, but yeah. where do they go wrong? Well, I, I think part of it is cultural that we typically, at least at like the international level, we're going to give our best players that opportunity to be the captain. But mm -hmm. we also have to understand what did they do to become the best player? It's mm -hmm. the same thing that set them up to be the best leader on the team. They understood that development progression. And there's no question coaching a team, whether it's high school, club or college, when your best player is also your best leader. That is a great, great play. I mean, it doesn't yeah. get any better than that. And so I think it's hard for a lot of coaches to say, you know what? My best player is not our best leader. And this player who comes off the bench and gives us 20 minutes is actually a phenomenal leader. And I'm going to pour into that person and develop that person. But to me, the biggest challenge is that cultural norm that says, if you're the best player, you're rewarded with an armband, you're rewarded with a title, and now we respect you as our captain. Mm -hmm. We can respect you as being a, a great player, but that does not mean that you're our best leader. That's a completely different skill set, right. and we have to be able to acknowledge that on our teams. Yeah, and, and like you said before, and teach it, yes. right? So this is the skills that make you a great point guard. Right. And these are the skills that make you a great leader. Absolutely. And just like you need to develop those point guard skills, you need to develop the leadership skills. But yeah. we're not going to give you this title without you right. having ever developed these skills. I think that's that's such an important thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you talk about the four R's then. What are they? What are the four uh, R's for a leadership? Th these are fun. These are fun. Um so for me, when you think as a coach about how to develop your leaders, I, I love to break it down into what I call the four R's. And so the first one is what is your role as mm -hmm. a leader? And I think it's often assumed, well, you're the leader. That's the role. And I'm like, nope, mm -hmm. you got to unpack that a little bit more. Same as we would in a, in, in a sports set, setting. Mm -hmm. we, we assume we know what it means to be the point guard, but actually we need to break that down. Like, what does that look like on this team? So for me, when I think about what's your role as a leader, I'm I'm talking about how are you in relationship with your teammates? Because mm -hmm. there's lots of different ways a leader could be in a relationship with their teammates. For example, maybe on your team, you want your leaders to be like firefighters. Mm -hmm. if, if there's an issue, you want that leader to jump in and put that out right away. That's mm -hmm. That's one way a leader could be in relationship with their teammates. Or maybe you want them to be more like uh, a visionary. You want them to be able to do stuff that no one else has been able to do yet. You want them to win at everything. Well, that's a different way to be in relationship. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you want them to be a drill sergeant. <laughs> Certainly there are environments where being a leader is like being a drill sergeant. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's how you want them to be in relationship. Or a last example I'll give is maybe you want them to be more like a mentor that walks mm -hmm. side by side with their teammates. But if we leave that up to the leaders to decide, who mm -hmm. knows what they'll pick? And mm -hmm. so as a coach, you got to give some clarity. Here's mm -hmm. the role I want you to have. In other words, mm -hmm. here's how I want you to connect and be related to your teammates. Give some real specificity behind that. And mm -hmm. because there's a big difference between a firefighter and a mentor. 
Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a time and place for both, but mm-hmm. I need my coach to tell me, how do I have a role? How am I in relationship with my team? And, and I, I think especially when you have multiple captains, right. like you're picking them because they fill different roles as well, yes. right? If you yes. have three drill sergeants, some people are going to get trampled. Yes. And if you have sure. three mentors, the people who need a, a kick in the butt might not get it. Right. Right. And yeah. If we don't have that conversation, we don't we don't give them clarity around yeah. how do I want you to connect with your teammates. Yeah. yeah. So and would you with- say, would you say like would you would your first question say how you know you know hey Molly you've been selected as captain what do you see your role as being why yeah. or no do you give it to them or do you see if it comes out of them. I mean, I, I would have a conversation about it, but I would I would put some parameters around that because if yeah, you let okay. they, they may all pick drill sergeant <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and to be able to say, actually, the leadership <laughs> gifts that I see in you, the, the, the leadership talents mm. that I see in you, I see you being much more like a teacher. And that's how mm. I'd like you to be in relationship. Mm. And there's something about, you know, I think back to my days as a high school and college student, there's something about an adult who notices something. Oh, hundred percent. Maybe you haven't noticed before. And so to be able to say, let me tell you, I know you're only 20 years old, but here's the skill. Here's the gift, the talent that I see in you as a leader. You're like a teacher and mm. man, do our freshmen need you to be that teacher. Mm. Ooh, all of a sudden I'm like, sign me up. I'll mm-hmm. do that for the <laughs> team. Because um, they're scared to death of so-and-so. Right. They need you to come in and teach and and stay after and give them a hug and whatever, because they're never going to ask this person for it because they're so afraid of him or her yeah. letting them down, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I love sure. that. For sure. Super. So Great. it starts with, it starts with their roles. And yep. then we got to talk about what are your responsibilities mm. within that role? Mm-hmm. Because again, I think sometimes we assume well, you're the leader. That's what you're responsible for. Well, what the heck does that mean? Help mm-hmm. help me understand. Most adults wouldn't understand that. Certainly a 15-year-old or a 20-year-old is not going to mm-hmm. understand that. So help me understand what, what are the jobs? What are the tasks? What are the things that you're expecting me to do on top of being a teammate, on top mm-hmm. of being a player? What are my uh, responsibilities as a leader? And then the third is, are there any rules that I really need to be aware of as a leader? And those rules are likely at a higher standard than they are for the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. So maybe you have a team that you expect everybody to get a 3.0 GPA, but for your leaders, you're actually expecting a Mm 3.25. Have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe there's a curfew for everybody. But for your leaders, you expect them to be in a little bit earlier, setting a different example. So mm. again, what are the rules on top uh, mm. of, of my team rules? But what are my rules as a leader? Um, and then lastly, that that fourth R is what are the reasons behind all of this? Mm-hmm. And I say that not from a sense of entitlement, not I'll do it if I understand why, coach. I, I need you to tell me why. It's not that. It's the fact that leadership is so contextual that if Mm -hmm. I can understand, if I can get in your head as a coach and understand why all this stuff matters, when the context or the situation or the environment changes, I can adapt because I understand why you're asking me to do what you're asking me to do. Mm -hmm. You're setting me up for success Mm -hmm. by giving me that inside view of what's going on in your head. I can now say, actually, I know coach well enough to know that in this moment, which I've never been in before, this Mm. is how they would want me to behave or act or respond or what they would want me to do. We'd never talked about it. We'd never planned for it. They didn't give me a list of here's a hundred challenges you might face as a leader, but I understand the why behind everything my coach is doing that I can make a split second decision that sets me up for success and sets my team up for success as well. Mm Mm-hmm. I, I love those four R's because certainly whenever leadership breaks down, it's going to break down one of those places, yeah. right? <laughs> that I didn't know my role or my responsibilities, right? I I didn't know the rules governing how I should do this and um, – or – you know, I, I'm not thinking like, well, why, why was I being, why was I given this because of this is what the team needs. And therefore that's the guiding principle that helps me act. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, I think this is so important. And I'm thinking about teams that I've worked with that have had fantastic leadership groups. And I would look at your framework and go, yep, that's why. Because this was all crystal clear. And I've looked at others and go, and, and oftentimes I think, I think a lot of, I think, you know, these teams of uh, people have understood their roles and responsibilities. I think a lot of times they, they mess up the rules. They become a leader and therefore they think the rules don't apply to them. Yes. When in actuality, there may be more rules that apply exactly, to you. 100%. Exactly. Exactly. But I'm a senior. So yeah, I'm going to go out, but none of you can go out, Right. but I'm a senior. So I know how to do it. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and that inconsistency erodes your influence right it turns your influence negative and it, and and just why would i follow you like you don't walk the walk right you just talk right. the talk yeah yeah but being intentional about this i wow i, I think this is huge this is so important so I, I love the section you have a section in the course on managing difficult players and difficult moments um mm -hmm. And there's not a coach out there who doesn't have difficult players and difficult moments. Right. Right. <laughs> um, and in my experience, I, I, I'm consistently amazed how oftentimes we, we, you know, coaches just become the ostrich and try to stick your head in the sand and hope it goes away. Right. And so um, how do we, you know, what, what is your advice for, for this first to the coach? Right. Yeah. You're the coach. The, the first piece of advice is we have to understand why they are being difficult. Mm -hmm. What's what's the story behind that? Because it, it is human nature when we don't know why we make up a story. Yeah. Well, she's she's a really difficult kid. Is that why? Or does she have a different learning style? That and we're not... Psychology is like the fundamental attribution error. I think that's what it is. We attribute <laughs> it to you know, their lack of care or whatever right, without right. ever knowing what's behind it. Yeah. 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 I remember one team I was working with and th this player was as polite. She was, she was exactly who you wanted to coach as a player, mm -hmm. but man, she struggled to process information. And mm -hmm. it took us a while to figure out when you draw it up for her, she's good. Mm -hmm. But when you just in her face in a timeout telling her what to do, she's going to nod her head and yes, ma'am, you all day and then not go do no it. No idea what no you just clue. said. Yeah. No clue. And, and of course, the temptation is to yank her out of the game and say she wasn't paying attention. She wasn't listening. She's difficult. No, she just has a, has a different learning style. And so we have to get to the root cause. And and, and I love breaking down. You know, I, I feel like there's five really specific reasons why a player doesn't do what they're supposed to do. And, and we got to get inside their minds and understand that because then we can respond appropriately. We can respond as educators, not as frustrated people who feel like you're trying to make my life difficult by mm -hmm. not doing what I'm asking you to do. Mm. And I, I, I would think, I don't know what your five reasons are, and maybe we should discuss them, yeah. but I would think one of the five would be they just don't care, but oftentimes that's the first thing we go to, and it should probably right. be the last thing we go to. Correct. It, it's yeah. number five on my list. So yeah. uh, to walk through those, the first is I didn't I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Like uh, in a basketball game, seconds left on the clock, we're going to full court press four of the five players <laughs> knew, right? And of course, it's the one player that yeah. screws it all up. But it's like, we didn't tell her. We, we mm -hmm. had a breakdown in communication. Mm -hmm. And so that falls on us as coaches. How are we mm -hmm. communicating this? So the first one, hey, they're off the hook there. They just didn't know. Mm -hmm. The second is they didn't know how, like you, mm -hmm. you asked me to do something and I didn't know how to do that. And mm -hmm. again, that falls on us. Let's mm -hmm. teach them how to do what we're asking mm -hmm. them to do. The third is they didn't know why. And again, mm -hmm. that's not a sense of entitlement, but it's teaching such a high level of IQ that they can make decisions mm -hmm. in a moment. Um, we could use basketball again. You called a timeout and you said, here's what we're going to do. But then the game changed. We missed that free throw or we made that free throw or there was a turnover. Okay, now I know why. I know the game well enough to make a different decision. The fourth, I struggled with this as a coach, is we're asking them to do something they can't. Right. They just they don't have the competency it. to do it. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's... <laughs> 
I, I shared this example the other day with someone else. I, I was working with a power five women's basketball team and the coach was a man to man defense. That's it. That's all we do. That's all we'll ever do type coach. And they had hit a, a, a point in the season with a lot of injuries and it was all the bigs that were mm -hmm. injured. And we were getting ready to go on the road and play a team that had a player who's now in the WNBA at six foot five. And our biggest player was like five foot eight. And mm -hmm. I'm saying to the head coach, how are we going to handle that? <laughs> she said, she's just got to figure it out. She's got to mm -hmm. figure it out. I'm like, she's five foot eight mm -hmm. defending a six foot five. She can't like, mm -hmm. I know you believe in her and I know you believe in your strategy. She can't can't. And mm -hmm. after several conversations, that coach said, you know what? I think we need to change our defense. We, we need to go to a zone defense to set mm -hmm. ourselves up for success. Mm -hmm. But we do that sometimes as coaches, we believe in our ability and we believe in their ability, but sometimes we're asking people to do things. They just can't physically mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. And then that last one, as you alluded to is I don't want to, mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. I want to mm -hmm. pad my stats or, or, or I want to play a different role on the team. I don't want to. And when mm -hmm. it comes to that, that's a culture fit that falls on the student athlete. And we may have to make some hard decisions there about can, can we have you on this team going forward? If we're asking you to do things that will help us win and help us be successful and you just don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but to your point, we tend to jump to that one first when we may realize, oh gosh, no one told her. No one told her we were going to full court press. That's on us. And we've mm -hmm. got to be better in that sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and we jump to that because it's easier to attribute that to them than it is like, oh, those first couple, which is on me or us as a coach, and then, you know, and then on them as just, you know, man, I recruited the wrong kid because she can't do this, and I thought she could, and then finally she doesn't care. It's easier to just go, oh, they just don't care because it couldn't be yes. me, and I couldn't right. have got the recruiting wrong. So right. it's got to be her, right? Yes. Or him yes. or whatever. So right. yeah, uh, that's interesting. I, I think, I mean, I, I call it, you know, in our new book, Jerry and I wrote uh, about this and I always call this, you know, this is petting the dragons, right? Because, you know, you just gave an example of, hey, this is a play in the game. But in my experience, the most difficult moments are often culture issues, locker room issues, relationships, cliques, factions, whatever you want to talk and and coaches ignore them, mm -hmm. right? And and there's this great children's book called There's No Such Thing as a Dragon and 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 I wrote a whole chapter on that in this new book about like, you know, when you pet the dragon, they stay small and cute, you know, when you acknowledge the problem, but if you ignore them and say there's no such thing as a dragon, they become huge. Yeah. Right. And I see so many coaches ignoring these things until they take over the locker room. And then they're like, can you fix my problem? How long have you been aware of this problem? And what have you done about it? Well, well, nothing. We've known about it for months, but we've just ignored it and hoped it would go away. How's that working for you? Right. Right. So, I mean, I got to imagine you, in your role, a lot of times you're just the truth teller. Yes. Yes. Yeah. In fact, we talk about uh, this in the last unit mm -hmm. of coach ready. When we talk about high performing teams, um, I say this statement, transformation is on the other side of truth. Mm -hmm. And so many teams I work with want the transformation, but they don't want to tell each other the truth. Yeah. And the only path to being better, to being healthy, to being high performing is we have to tell the truth. And mm -hmm. in some cultures, you know, the truth is not allowed here. And those will never be high performing teams, but the mm. teams that are able to sit down and tell each other the truth and be honest, they will transform. They, they will get to that place. And so when a team calls and says, oh, the ship is sinking. Okay. We got to, we got to sit down and tell the truth. Oh no, 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 no. That won't go over well here. We, we can't do that. Then you're never, you're never going to get to that. And point get the lifeboat out because you're yes. toast. Yeah. And, and I think, and I, in my experience, this happens more with female teams than male teams. And I, yeah. and I, and this isn't the fault of those young women. It's because of the way that they're culturalized and just said, you know, just be nice, right? Just be nice, just be nice, right? And and yeah. so ignore the way you're being treated or ignore the problem yeah. because don't rock the boat, right? And so I feel like yeah, you really have to when you're working with high performance women's teams to get in and make them comfortable. But the best ones are very comfortable having those difficult conversations 
acknowledging the problems and 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 again sometimes as the facilitator like you're like look there's going to be tears anger harsh words but we're not walking out of this room until it's it's all out yeah. right and you can yeah. see at the end of those meetings this like palpable yep. thank god right yep. because it's there and it's affecting everything that's happening and no one wants to pet the dragon you know, acknowledge the elephant, whatever you want to call yes. it. Yes, yes. Who's going to name the thing in Who's the room? Who's going to name the thing? Because it's here. Yep. <laughs> and and it's we all know it. We and all, we all know, know it. it. Yep. So, so come on, you know, and, and, and it's, it's there. All right. Last, last little piece here. You you have in a uh, unit around trauma and, and I think you're, you just finished or you're working on a certification in that area as well. So talk about trauma and how it affects teams and athletes and, and why this is important for coaches to be aware of. Yeah. In the last year, I decided to go back to grad school and, and do a program in trauma and resiliency. And my coursework to date has not at all focused on athletics. And yet as I'm learning and growing and reading this material, I can't help but see it through the lens of yeah. athletics. Yeah. And I feel pretty strongly that that understanding trauma right now is, is kind of like the key that will unlock a lot of things for us. We have so many young people who have experienced a high volume of trauma, and yet we're not talking about it and we're not equipped to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to give coaches just a foundational level. And I don't know what the I think the video is six or six or eight minutes long on trauma. It's it's not a graduate course in trauma, but understanding how it physically shows up in a young player's body. It's it's pretty mind blowing when we understand the limitations that trauma can cause for us physically. Mm -hmm. When we understand the behaviors that can show up. So, sometimes I'm in a space with a team and a player acts out and I think that doesn't make sense. Why would mm -hmm. they act that way? When we start to understand how trauma can cause us to behave in ways that simply doesn't make sense can be really powerful. When we understand the language that we use, particularly this idea that a team is a family, mm -hmm. um, if you have come from a family that has experienced a lot of trauma, it is really hard to come into a team and say, this is a family and behave differently. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you've been a part of a family where dad comes home, and beats the wife and kids. And then in the morning, everybody has their cereal and goes about their day. You're going to come to your team that now everyone is calling a family and think, I can yell at you. We'll be fine tomorrow. I can right. degrade you in the locker room. We're family. This mm -hmm. We don't give up on our family. And so really mm -hmm. being intentional around that language can be super, super powerful. And so I think I think coaches, I think administrators, professors as well need some more education around trauma because it is everywhere. It's mm -hmm. everywhere. And once mm -hmm. we understand that, we can help people navigate those experiences a little bit better. Mm. One of my former athletes, uh, and, uh, you know, a young woman who I've been helping sort of start her business, who was a division one college athlete and everything is sort of given back in in this space. And, and she was just telling me she just did a certification on social media trauma. So there's this whole other level. I mean, never mind the family. Now you have an entire world with access to traumatize you if you live in that space. And it's very hard for a young person to not live in that space. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I just would thought that was fascinating and and whatever of of like man the, there's so much right and this is i mean maybe we finish with this like the, and this is coaching today right it's mm -hmm. not x's and o's no it, it's so much more yeah. because you are dealing with the entire human being yep. right and getting humans to work collectively for something while understanding each individual yep. um helping them deal with their own demons their own trauma, their own, you know, struggles in life, um, right. trying to develop people who maybe don't have a lot of resiliency because of the way they were raised. Um, you're also working with parents and their oftentimes negative influence on the student athlete. Yep. Um, yeah, coaching's right. coaching's very different than it was 15 years ago. Yeah, absolutely yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. absolutely.
Molly, this is awesome. Um, any final word? And then I know, and then where can people find you? And we're going to put all this stuff in the show notes as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Mollygrisham.com is kind of my hub. You can find my social media there, all my services there. I think the one thing I would say, want to say to your listeners is the work they're doing matters. We need good coaches who are good humans, who are uh, maximizing their own personal growth so that they can invest in their people. And if there are ways I can support your listeners, um, please just go to my website, send me an email, let, let's chat, consider me in your corner cheering you on. Um, I want to, I want to support as many coaches as I can. And as we've alluded to a few times, I've got this new program called coach ready, which I, I think is going to make a difference for coaches at all ages and all stages of the game and hope that they'll check that out as well. Brilliant. Molly, this was a great conversation. Thanks so much again, Molly Grisham.com and Molly Grisham on Twitter and YouTube and dot Grisham on Instagram. So, um, this was a great conversation. I got a ton of notes here. Really, really interesting stuff. Thought provoking for me. The course, the Coach Ready course is really, really good. So I highly recommend that as well. Thanks so much for being on the way, champions. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for listening. Thank you to Molly Grisham. Uh, again, mollygrisham.com, molly.grisham on Instagram, or just Molly Grisham, uh, M-O-L-L-Y-G-R-I-S-H-A-M on Twitter and YouTube and uh, check it out. Um, that was awesome. Um, last little bit here as we're signing off again, if we, we've closed registration for Wave Champions, could probably add a few um, live stream people, or if you want to add on to a group or last second change of plans, you want to meet us in Colorado, just email me, john at changingthegameproject.com. And uh, if we have a spot, I'll let you know and we'll get you signed up, all right? Remember, everyone, just like Molly and I just talked about on this podcast for quite a while, your influence is never neutral. So go out there. Use your influence for good. Know your role. Know your responsibilities. Know the rules. Know the reasons why. See you again next week.